Hi, and welcome to All Around Azure, a developer's guide to IoT. My name is Jason Hand, and I'm proud to be part of this team putting together this event for you today. We are the third of uh, several different events happening all around the world over 24 hours, and uh, we got a lot of really great stuff to pass on to you today regarding IoT from a lot of great experts. But before we get started, there's a few housekeeping things that we want to touch on. So we'll pull that information up here. Um, along with uh, the events from today, we want to make sure that we pass on this message that it's very important for us that we keep a uh, respectful mindset with everybody involved putting on this event today, everybody in chat, ev every one of our speakers um, as they put on their sessions. Uh, the code of conduct is very important for us. So please be mindful of that um, as you uh, participate in today's event. The next thing we want to talk about is just a little uh, on the agenda. We've got five great sessions today from our experts on IoT. Each of them will be going for roughly 15 minutes or so, and we'll follow that up with Q&A by um, myself as well as the host. We'll be answering any questions that you might have for us in chat, so feel free to you know, add those. Um, yeah, and that's about it. So uh, to, I guess to move things on and just keep this thing moving along on schedule, we're going to kick things off now with a keynote conversation between two of our friends, Sam George and Olivia Block. So we'll hand it over to them. Hello and welcome to the first virtual all around Azure IoT event. Uh, that's your getting started on IoT technologies and uh, on your way to getting certified. And today, um, joining me, I have Sam George, our CVP for engineering for Azure IoT. I am Olivier Block. I am a technical PM in the Azure IoT engineering team looking after communities. How about you, Sam? Give us a little introduction about yourself. Yeah, Sam George, uh, been at Microsoft uh, quite some time. Uh, former developer myself, so uh, developers are very near and dear to my heart. Uh, thrilled to be with you today. Thanks, Sam. So today, what Sam would like to give you a little bit of insight about you know, why you should care about this event. Why would you want to become an Azure IoT certified uh, engineer? And what, why would you want to go through the topics that we have today uh, for you? But before we go there, um, think about this event as your launch pad on your way to becoming certified for Azure IoT. Uh, you'll get some learnings today about how to connect the device all the way up how to integrate with business application, how to bring ML at the edge and apply on IoT data. Uh, but all of that obviously is in the context of, um, you know, how the business is evolving and how things are growing. And so Sam, what about, you know, the ecosystem and how is the landscape looking these days for IoT? Yeah, well, what, one of the great things about being a developer in IoT now is that businesses around the world have recognized the benefit of IoT. You know, IoT gives you visibility into all physical aspects of your business in real time, and businesses just didn't have that insight before. Um, but at the same time, it requires a pretty uh, sophisticated level of development, everything from embedded development to edge computing to cloud solution development to biz app development and you know, everything that we've been working so hard to provide over the last five years makes that easier and easier and easier. So you know, there's really never been a better time to be a developer in IoT. The technology is ready and there's a tremendous amount of demand for developers in IoT. Yeah, and what's interesting is, um, so not only IoT solutions span from these devices all the way up to the business applications, and that means that you have different types of software engineers that need to be involved, you know, to build the device on one side, to connect it, uh, to work on the networking, on the security, but also on the web side of things, right? The dashboarding yep. and the the also the use of the cloud services back end. So, Lots of different software engineers are not involved. So hence, one more reason for people actually to learn about IoT, even if their background is not embedded development. Um, there's also a dimension which I find really interesting in the world we're evolving is that it's not just software engineers. Now you need to work with data scientists. You need to work with you know chemical or physical or mechanical engineers. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's pretty interesting. And um, you know, in that context, Sam, I'd like for you to get people excited if they're not familiar familiar with IoT applications and solutions, what's your favorite IoT solution out there? Well, it's hard to say one particular favorite. Um, there's so many that are happening right now, but one of them that I'll, I'll talk about briefly 
um, is one by a great company in New York City uh, called RxR, RxR Realty. And they've developed a solution that as people are coming back into their buildings, into offices, to help keep people safer uh, in this time of COVID-19. And what it really shows, what this uh, Rx Well solution, they call it, shows is how IoT, edge computing, AI, and cloud can really help provide solutions that help keep people safer. So what Rx Well does is it uses cameras running our edge computing platform, IoT Edge, um, that are mounted in various parts of the building, as well as sensors. And what it does is it ensures that number one, people are wearing masks, that they're uh, ensuring safe social distancing, they're staying six feet apart or not, um, that you know different parts of the building aren't being overly crowded, that there's not too many people in one particular area. Um, it's also tied into the building infrastructure itself. So it ensures that there's high airflow, for example, in the building. So all of this winds up meaning that instead of having to go around and manually ensure people are wearing masks and safe social distancing and things like that, that the building tenants and the administrators just start getting alerts uh, when they're not. And then they can go and help, you know, just sort of remind folks um, to be safe. So all of this is combined then to help really keep people safer in an automated fashion. And it's a great testament to the power of IoT and edge computing and AI all working together. Nice. And so actually it makes me think, you know, can you give us a little bit insight into what is it that Azure IoT is providing? So customers are implementing these end-to-end -end solutions, but how yeah. do we contribute? What is our role in all of that? Yeah, so let's talk about the RX, uh, the RX Well solution. Uh, and I'll talk about just briefly the different areas. We provide everything from everything in the cloud. Um, so we have our Azure IoT Hub cloud service, which is used for connecting to and managing those millions of devices, sending trillions of messages. We have data services, we have business application integration services. You'll hear all about those today. But then out on the edge, we also have our edge computing platform, Azure IoT Edge that helps developers run cloud services such as AI workloads directly on devices themselves, as well as SDKs for running on devices themselves, um, down to the very tiniest of devices. So we have Azure RTOS that runs on devices with as little as 50 kilobytes of memory. Um, we have Azure Sphere, which provides a safe and secure endpoint uh, that's uh, monitored by Microsoft and always up to date. And then we have a device SDK that runs on virtually every operating system in IoT on the planet in every language popular, uh, popular language developers are using today. All of that is open source um, and uh, broadly supported by our team. Nice. And on the cloud side of things, we, we talk a lot about integrating with business applications and so on. So how, how does that work up there? Yeah, we make that super, super easy uh, with offerings like Azure Logic Apps, uh, as well as Power Automate. Um, so those those two tools, Power Auto Services, I should say, Power Automate uh, and Logic Apps, provide connectors to well over 250 business integration systems, uh, business systems, and not just by Microsoft. You know, lots and lots and lots of different services, um, SAP, Salesforce, and on and on. And so, as a signal is detected in the physical world, and you need to alert some business process, we make that really, really easy to integrate with. Nice. And in our in our goal to simplifying IoT, so we're building all these uh, Lego blocks, right, to build your own solution. But we also are offering IoT Central, right? Can you give us a little bit, um, you know, of insights about uh, what is IoT Central and what yeah. is it meant for? So all of the all of the different uh, almost building block platform services that I just covered so far, um, you can assemble them just like RxR did into these solutions that, that help fuse uh, the physical world and the digital world and provide insights in real time. Um, what we've learned in our time uh, in market is that not every, uh, not every company has the development skills that are required to do that. And so what we've done is we've put together an offering called Azure IoT Central. And what Azure IoT Central does is it uses all of those different cloud services uh, that I was covering and more. Um, but it puts it together in a very simple to use SaaS offering with a super predictable price per device pricing uh, that gets cheaper and cheaper the, the more devices that you use. You don't have to worry about uh, assembling those cloud services or scaling them up independently. You simply connect devices to it. You can connect devices in just minutes. 
Um, and as you add devices, Azure IoT Central uses all of those services, automatically scales up, it provides out of the box, rich dashboards, uh, analytics, and then also business process integration. Uh, so it takes advantage of, of Power Automate Logic Apps. Um, it has continuous data export, so you can export all of your data on an ongoing basis from IoT Central to downstream Azure services. So we've made it super easy. We like to say that IoT Central enables you to connect devices in just minutes, go to production the same day, and scale to any amount of devices, all without needing cloud solution development skills. Yeah, I've been pretty amazed by the amount of features that are now in IoT Central. Actually, one that is super important for our developers is the APIs that IoT Central mm -hmm. exposes. It's not it's not a black box. It's something that you can right. develop with and around um, and integrate into your solution end to end. Um, exactly Sam, right. what about what's coming next? What's the vision? Where are we going with all of that? Yeah, so if you step back and look at what's happening in the industry right now, IoT has really gained mainstream adoption over the last five years. And the primary use of IoT has been to find insights from, you can think of it as insights from assets, right? Um, HVAC machines or um, uh, water pumps or elevators, you know, to find the maintenance needs, to predict those maintenance needs, um, to gain insights from those. But it's really been geared towards the assets themselves. And what we're starting to see now in IoT is that as IoT becomes more and more um, mainstream, that companies are wanting to connect entire environments. So for example, I'll pick on manufacturing. They're, they're interested in not just connecting to the manufacturing assets, right? The uh, bottling machines or the milling machines or the um, welding machines. They're interested in connecting to the entire environment, the building itself, all of the people that are in it, um, the inbound supply chain, the outbound distribution network, and to find insights from that entire environment. And so just late last year, we made generally available Azure Digital Twins. And what Azure Digital Twins is, is it enables you to model entire environments. Um, so you can model them first, uh, then you can connect IoT sensors as well as other business signals to Azure uh, Digital Twins. Um, and what Azure Digital Twins does is it effectively builds a live distributed object model that represents that physical environment. And then it enables you to data bind to the physical environment. And then as the physical environment changes, Azure Digital Twins raises events, you handle those events, you implement business logic. So Digital Twins is really the next stage of uh, the evolution of these connected solutions. Um, and then just over the horizon, we start to see businesses starting to partner over the insights that they gain in these connected environments and to provide really you know, intelligent ecosystems that we're all work together. So it's an incredibly exciting time. We've made it really easy um, and it's a great time to be a developer in IoT. Nice, yeah, and and actually, interesting. You mentioned digital twins as as the uh, as the uh, the hero next big, you know, feature or service over here because I've seen actually lots of different types of engineers very yeah. interested in the use of digital twins. Like when you come from a different background, you're not a software engineer. You need to have this level, this graph that allows you to rapidly ingest all that data from various sources, and you don't want to build or having to build these these blocks, these, these things that are not, you know, it's there. complicated plumbing. It's hard to get right. Um, you know, it took us several years to get it to market um, because yeah. it's so it's so complicated. But what's nice is that now we've simplified that and you can simply model in a very flexible language we call the digital twin definition language. You can simply yeah. model that any 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 environment, the relationships between things, um, send that to Azure Digital Twins and we'll materialize that distributed object model for you. I like that, I like that. What are we doing to simplify how solution developers connect devices? Like I know devices is something that is, is complex by nature. Also, when you want to connect devices from various types, various manufacturers, various uh, places, well, they all come up with their own protocol, their own language, their own way of exposing their data. So what are we yeah. doing in that space to help developers integrate this, their devices with the devices from other companies, partners, whatnot, into their solutions? Yeah, well, one of the challenges that we saw over the last five years in IoT is that there's this incredibly tight coupling uh, between 
software that runs on the device and software that runs in the solution. So as an example, if your device is hard coded to send temperature and humidity and vibration, your cloud solution has to be hard coded to receive temperature and humidity and vibration. And often there's even an expectation about how frequently it's, it sends. And so, you know, in early IoT, honestly, that wasn't a problem. But what what's you know what IoT is starting to bump up against is that device providers are now wanting to provide devices that can be used generally in lots of different solutions, not just one. And solution providers are wanting uh, much easier onboarding experiences for devices where they're not effectively having to just go down to bare metal on the device and hard code a bunch of uh, you know sensor information that's coming from the device. So as part of our push last year on digital twins, we introduced and made generally available what we call IoT plug and play. And what IoT plug and play is, is very simple. It's, um, it uses the digital twin definition language to help developers, device providers, ex uh, explain or to attest what capabilities the device has, what telemetry it sends, what state that it can synchronize, what commands that it receives and the responses that it sends from those commands and things like that. And that's all packaged up in the digital twin definition language for the device that uses the digital twin definition language. Now, when the device first connects, it sends its a pointer to its document for this digital twin definition language document. And then the solution can simply automatically adjust to what the device can do. So we showed a demo, and we'll, I think we'll be showing that as part of this series, showed a demo where you can simply take a device that Azure IoT Central, for example, has never seen before. And as the device is connected and goes through our device provisioning service into IoT Hub, which is being used by IoT Central, IoT Central automatically shows a dashboard for the device. It shows all the different data fields that the device is sending, the telemetry, any of the state that it can synchronize, the commands that it can receive, all without writing a single line of code in the cloud to configure it. So it's a super powerful way uh, effectively to program IoT devices. Love it, love it. Um, well, I hope that we have everyone's attention here. Uh, before we wrap up, Sam, um, besides having us learn to work remotely and record this kind of events online, right, and also deliver that to more people, where uh, yeah. you know from the home, uh, do you see any impact from COVID and the pandemic on the IoT business itself? Yeah, for sure. Um, in fact, we've seen an acceleration. You know, most companies, we, we do this uh, signals report, we call it the IoT signals report, where we go and um, uh, uh, survey uh, businesses from around the, the planet, about 3,200 different businesses. Um, and what we're seeing in general from all of those businesses is that for businesses that were getting started with uh, IoT or that already had an IoT solution, IoT has in fact accelerated. It's much, much, much faster. Um, now, of course, some of the businesses where there were lights out, where they weren't able to get to, you know, they hadn't done that, um, an IoT solution yet, and they were unable to get to their physical premises. Um, of course, that had an impact. But even there, we're starting to see uh, return to work uh, and people getting going. So net, all up, it's really had an accelerating impact on IoT. So again, another great reason uh, to be an yeah. IoT developer. Yeah, so time to time to wrap up. Thanks, uh, Sam, a lot for your time and your insights. Um, we really hope we have your attention and that you understand how important um, having skilled IoT engineer is uh, for, for the business these days. It's really for you an opportunity to grow in your career. Um, we have a bunch of content for you today, uh, but once again, do not stay at just the event of today. We consider that as your launch pad to becoming an Azure IoT certified engineer. And so for that, we have a 30 days, 30 days to learn it challenge, uh, which is available for you at this link. And what that is, is a set of self-paced, um, you know, IoT learning courses um, that you will have to go through. And if you make it in these 30 days, um, you will receive a 50% off on a Microsoft IoT certification exam. So I think it's really worth it. Um, mm -hmm. And once again, on your way to becoming certified, um, do not forget to sign up. It's this link or at the bottom of the uh, All Around Azure event. Sam, once again, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, enjoy the uh, um, event today, and I hope to see you soon. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. 
excellent conversation from our good friends Olivier uh, and uh, what uh, and George, of course, and uh, and look who it is. We got our very first guest uh, and presenter for t this afternoon, uh, Anthony Bartolo. Anthony, how are you? How about yourself, Jason? Uh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. And for those who aren't familiar with with our first uh, our first speaker here, this is Anthony. He's a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft, a good friend of ours on the show here. And uh, Anthony and I have, have had the pleasure of traveling a bit together and getting to know each other on and working on some different projects. And one of the most, uh, I guess, uh, fun things I got to learn about Anthony very early on is, is he started off his career in, in kind of the mechanics world and uh, has you know, adopted and pivoted towards technology. And uh, you know, some of the things that we really, I guess, share about uh, passions we have each other is, is taking some of those uh, things that we learned as gearheads and non-technical stuff and then applying it to the real world. Uh, so yeah, Anthony, I'm gonna, let, uh, I'm gonna let you take it from here and um, share a little bit more about uh, yourself as well as what we're gonna be talking about. So yeah, Anthony. Thank you, Jason. Uh, you know what, the whole aspect of being a mechanic and working on vehicles was in essence my introduction into IoT, right? I remember working on vehicles before the ECU or the, the computer inside of the vehicles was made available and you had to deduce, you know, via hearing and feel and, 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 and experiencing what the car was going through uh, in terms of understanding how to repair it. Uh, when the ECU was actually introduced in a lot of the mainstream vehicles, now we had this way of connecting via serial bus to a 46 computer to have the ability of uh, understanding what the car was outputting in terms of the errors that were, were occurring. So the whole thing that occurred in that respect is, you know, the ability to now receive this automation of notification when there was an issue occurring in the vehicle itself. We're going to talk a little bit about that in this session today in terms of what is IoT and what is Microsoft's uh, Azure IoT offering? What does that mean for solutioning? The whole aspect of the opportunities that are out there and how are we going to address those opportunities with the technology made available? Also, the availability of looking at real-world implementations of Azure IoT, not just for the sake of adding technology to uh, add technology to so, to a solution, but more so to address an opportunity via technology to provide automation, to provide further insight, to really flush out the opportunity at hand and addressing it in the best way possible with all the data that's being captured. So let's get started. First, we're going to go right to the you know right to the foundational of what is IoT. And yes, it's you know we're going to start this route only because I want to break it up. I want to break it up in terms of IoT and OT. IoT or Internet of Things or Information of Things is what I've been saying as of late is the ability to have these devices on the edge. Uh, so let's go back to the vehicle scenario. This ECU inside of a vehicle, uh, it captures all the information from the vehicle. Some, uh, as an example, the rotation of a tire as the car drives, the ability to capture that information if the, the tire is rotating uh, properly, uh, if it's, you know, if there's an issue with the tire rotating itself, if there's a, a pause in terms of the tire rotating or there's a bump, you know, all that information being captured by the ECU. Back in the day when I was a mechanic, I would connect that device, um, that ECU to a computer and the output would come out on the computer and I would read from the screen what the error code was from the, um, the vehicle itself. And that was the information that was being provided to me uh, in regards to the, the issue with the vehicle itself. Now we're, you know, capturing that information and it's going up into the cloud and we're capturing, you know, tons of information as opposed to a one-off. So instead of capturing the one uh, device, capturing that information, now it's going up to the cloud and all the information is being accumulated for us to do deduction and, and prediction in terms of this vehicle working this climate or this uh, elevation or this land terrain uh, is going to experience these problems and what we'll need to do to address that. Of things in the latter half of this explanation is the whole aspect of these devices also can provide automation as a result of the data that's being captured. So think of something as like traffic lights and the way that the lights uh, change colors when understanding traffic patterns that flow through. It is a response of, of, of a thing uh, based on the data that was captured through the internet or information of things previous on uh, to understand the environment and how to react uh, or how to address that opportunity of the instance that it's facing. A traffic light changing, a vent, uh, ventilating an area from heat, cold, what have you, uh, is the automated response after the information itself has been captured. So 
in innovations enabling new opportunities, the whole aspect is what, what I mentioned before of what it used to be in terms of a one-off. I would go to my vehicle or go to the vehicle that I was working on. I would connect that 46 computer to this vehicle. Uh, it would then pull out the information in terms of the error codes. And then through still deduction, I would have to go through all the error codes and understand you know, what the problem was. Then there was the introduction of the cloud. And now that meant I didn't have to connect this device specifically to this, to this vehicle. And you can still do that. Obviously, it's more a handheld device than a full-on computer cart that comes wheeled to the car. Uh, but that information can be captured up in the cloud to capture the information of different geographical regions, different climates, different uh, places that that same vehicle is being utilized in. So back to the scenario of the tire rotation, of, uh, you know, the car moving along on, on its wheels, you know, understanding that in this climate, you know, this is the way that the tire should be running uh, if it's hot, cold, uh, whatever that may be. And then taking that information a step further and capturing that information and putting it out to the cloud. In doing so, we now have the ability to accumulate the data across multiple geos, uh, multiple climates, multiple areas around the world for that same vehicle and understand how that vehicle you know, moves along in, in the different instances that it's experiencing. Adding to that is now the cap capability of edge computing. Back to the tire scenario, when I was capturing the information from that tire, it would provide an error code and the error code would still require me to deduce what's actually happening with the vehicle. In today's day and age, what actually happens now in terms of computing at the edge, there is some semblance of intelligence that's included into the ECU uh, or the computer within the vehicle to understand what the what the vehicle is experiencing in terms of the trouble that it's having. So maybe the, the tire itself is it needs more air, it's been deflated or it has a puncture in it. Uh, maybe the car needs to be uh, aligned. There's an alignment that's required. You know, it could provide you more information as opposed to just saying, hey, there's an error with your tire. This helps in terms of the ability to capture that data because now when the information does its rudimentary calculations of the error that's at hand, it can actually push that out to the cloud with a result as opposed to you know saying there's just an error with a tire and nothing more. This is hugely important in the inclusion of uh, edge computing and of course in, um, artificial intelligence to understand the problem at the root uh, when the information is being ingested to then have that ability to make a more uh, a better result or a better um, next step forward to address that opportunity. Uh, and listening to the keynote, you know, Digital Twins is the latest offering that's made available in the Azure IoT suite. And this is, you know, so crucial in terms of the evolution of the IoT solutions that are out there. The ability to understand in a virtualized plane, if I change factor X, so if I provide a new uh, computational piece inside of my ECU in my vehicle to detect if alignment is needed in the vehicle itself, Will it change the behavior of the information that's being captured? I don't have to test that out in production. I can do that in a virtualized plane and have production data feed the virtualized plane for me to do my analysis or for me to do my you know, changing of variables, changing of hardware, whatever that may be that I'm trying to better out that solution without affecting the production environment. This is huge because you're getting this real world data made available to you into your, your cloud, into your ingestion of all your data and understanding if the variables are made to be changed to better the solution, will it actually better the solution? Will it provide you more precise information or will it cause issues down the road? And developers can build out the solutions without affecting the on-premises implementation or the actual uh, in, in production implementation uh, and have a better understanding of what could, could occur when the variables are changed with real data as, as opposed to fictitious data. So that makes it a lot more real when you actually deploy said solution. So this is the, one of the challenges a lot of organizations face. They want to adopt IoT, but there's a lot of challenges that are you know, wrapped into IoT as an as a opportunity in itself. The whole aspect of long timelines. You know, what device do I use to deploy and capture information? How do I structure the data? How do I save the data? How do I store the data? How do I, who is allowed access to the data? Security equation uh, in terms of this. How do I scale out my solution? You know, it's great that I'm doing capturing of information just here in Toronto, but what about if I want to capture information out in Seattle and compare it to the information in California and, and compare it to information that's uh, based out of Milan? The whole ability to understand my data, I have to have a roadmap or a design of my architecture in terms of how my data is going to be flow and how it's, and how it's going to be uh, made available to those that require it or should have access to it. Not everybody should have access to that data, and you have to govern that as well. Customization. 
you know, if I have these sensors in the vehicles, are all vehicles built the same? You know, different wheelbases, di different um, widths of vehicles, uh, you know, different sizes of tires. How do I customize this one solution for this one vehicle and make it available on a plethora of vehicles that are out there and capturing that information? Can I then take that information and customize the way that it's being captured to make it more streamlined so that I can provide analytics across a multitude of cars as opposed to one specific vehicle? All these are th things that you know organizations have to take into consideration when doing their IoT deployment. And so this is where the Azure IoT Central Services Suite comes into play. The whole ability to have that plug and play capability to implement uh, a viable solution on behalf of your organization to understand what data is being captured, to understand the potential of the data that's being captured. Uh, the whole ability for device connectivity and management to be able to push out firmware to hardware. So, you know, the information that's being captured through the learnings of upskilling and, and, and furthering on the IoT solution, what are you going to add? To this functionality? What are you going to make available to this functionality? The whole ability for uh, data ingestion. How is the data being ingested? Who has access to that data? Who has the rights to that data? What services have rights to that data? Streamline, uh, sorry, stream processing and predictive analytics. Having that rudimentary calculation either at the edge or at the gateway when the information is being captured to digest the information as opposed to just capturing all the raw information. Workflow automation. How is the data being captured? How is it being streamlined? Where is it being passed to you for analytical work? dashboards and visualization. What is the output that you want to see from the information that's being captured? And how is that being translated to individuals uh, or to organizations in terms of the information that matters to them most? And then pre-configured solutions. This is you know a great one in terms of a plug and play scenario. I'm a manufacturing plant. I have these, these machines that build out widgets and you know they're similar to other manufacturing plants that do the same thing. So why recreate the wheel? There's a template made available that I can just simply plug and play my widget making machines to this template and start capturing information immediately, but still have the capability of doing customization as required to really flesh out the solution best based on my organization's needs using this template to quicken the process. So now I'm gonna take you through a real world scenario. And this solution here, you know, is a mousetrap solution uh, that was actually built out by a team of five uh, over a span of 40 hours. I was one of the members of this team and it was really interesting. And it was because it was early days of IoT I actually have the device right here. Uh, it is my Raspberry Pi enabled mousetrap. I wonder if the camera can actually pick that up. Uh, that still uh, works to this day, and we've actually seen it in action uh, in, in a more evolved state. Uh, this is a five-year-old project that was actually created. Uh, but what's interesting is I'm going to take you through the journey of how this solution was actually created and how the evolution of the uh, Azure IoT uh, services has now made the solution even better because of the, the plug and play functionality, the uh, the whole capability of doing the digital twin, the understanding of the, the data capture and how it took away from the complexity of designing the initial solution and how the solution is actually being used today. So the first step in doing this is always understanding the opportunity. Uh, I always abide by never adding technology for the sake of adding technology. You want to be able to really hone in on what the opportunity at hand, at hand is when you're deploying an IoT solution. In this scenario here, it's the whole aspect of rats and mice spread over 35 diseases. And there's you know unsightly boxes that are outside of buildings that you have to take in consideration you want to eliminate with. So and revenue, of course, you know, 12 billion a year, it's a you know, pretty sizable chunk in terms of revenue capability and opportunity. But the solution itself, once we've understood the opportunity back when we created the solution, it was complex, right? There was a whole aspect of taking this mousetrap, it was a $2 mousetrap from your local hardware store, connecting it to a Raspberry Pi. Now we're gonna capture that information. We need to strip away some of the information to understand what we're specifically trying to capture. Where's this information gonna be stored? How's the information gonna be outputted? What is the um, transport or what is the input mechanism that we can augment the data as required in terms of the information itself. The whole introduction of the Azure IoT suite and Azure IoT central offering makes it a lot easier to break down the solution as a whole to compartmentalize the ability of, you know, understand the information that's being captured in the management of the devices through IoT Hub, the ability to understand the data that's being captured through Azure Time Insights, the whole ability to have the automated response to say, hey, these mousetraps have to be cleaned out uh, through Azure Logic apps. This whole capability uh, is uh, made available through Azure IoT's uh, services and the 
the ability to really customize in a quick manner a deployment of this type of solution. So let's break it down even further in terms of the reference architecture. So the IoT devices, and in this case, it's the mousetrap, uh, having the ability to manage. This is the new firmware that I'm pushing out to this mousetrap, because now I want to not only know when the mouse has been captured, I want to know the temperature around the trap when the, when the mouse has been captured to have that additional data. That is then pushed out to the gateway or the IoT hub uh, to then funnel that information as required in regards to reporting tools of the raw data that's being captured or through stream processing to strip away specific data to uh, I have in, in regards to my storage, the data that only matters to me most. From there, you then have the action in terms of business integration. In the, in the scenario of the mousetrap, it's twofold. The reporting of you know, which mousetraps are catching the most mice and the reporting to the pest control company in terms of when the mousetraps themselves need to be cleared out. Now, the design was simple, right? It was, like I said, taking a $2 mousetrap, connecting it to a Raspberry Pi, and when the trap goes off, you know, you can see the, the aluminum foil there. It was very rudimentary uh, implementation. It'll actually complete a circuit. And at that point, that was the trigger in terms of capturing the information. At that time, the information that was being captured was the time that the mouse was captured, uh, the location of the device inside of the room, the location of the device via geographical or GPS coordinates, uh, and the uh, if it was um, uh, dark or uh, light, it was bright in the area where the mouse was caught. Uh, this is made available, and I'm also going to have this at the, at the end slide in terms of the resource as an open source solution, which a plethora of organizations have taken advantage of to build out into different solutions. And I'll show an example later on in this presentation. Uh, so if you visit aka.ms forward slash IoT 10 forward slash mousetrap, you'll have access to full source code as well as the architecture for the solution itself. In terms of reporting, and you know, once the analytics had been captured, we had this capability to then report, hey, these mousetraps that have uh, caught these mice. These are the areas inside of your building in terms of where the mice are, are formulating and where you can capture the most mice. So the pest control company are not only notified to say, hey, you're of your 100 traps, 60 of them have gone off. Now you have the ability to say, these are the rooms that are catching the most mice or the, the traps are catching the most mice are in these rooms. This is where you want to place more traps to ensure that you capture and get rid of all the mice in that area. Now let's take it a step forward. The whole introduction of digital twins now means that with the traps that are all deployed in you know, one specific customer's area or in a specific geographical region, I can input all that information from real world data, the deployment of the traps themselves, and have the ability to understand if I wanted to make changes to the solution as a whole, what will be the effect in terms of the outcome of catching mice? So in terms of the probabilities right now of catching mice, is I'm catching one per one on the traps itself because it's a singular trap and when it goes off, it's caught a mouse. What if I wanted to introduce a trap that would catch multitude of mice? So not just catching one mouse at a time. Now you're using a trap where it's a, uh, a bait inside into the cage and the mouse goes in the cage and they get stuck in the cage and they can't get out. There is the ability to include, let's say, a scale to you know, have a specific threshold in terms of weight, a weight in order to catch more mice. Will, how will that affect my solution going forward uh, in, ter in terms of changing the uh, mechanism at the end that catches the mice and reports on the, the ability to catch those, those uh, mice? So that whole digital twin capability has the ability to then funnel out uh, the information and tell me in real time what the effect would be in changing the mouse trap itself. So let's take it a step further. And how is this now being utilized in real world implementation? It's the ability to now take this open source solution for mouse traps and convert it to solutions like this. Right now, it's cold in Toronto. It's uh, 30 degrees Fahrenheit. It's around 2 degrees Celsius. Uh, we're expecting a foot of snow today. So we don't really see ice cream trucks out there. But during the summertime, you know, these are all around Toronto in terms of servicing ice cream to the general public. They've taken the opportunity to take that mousetrap solution and track instead of a mousetrap going off when the music on the truck itself turns off and the ability to then monitor when the truck is, uh, music has gone off, how many ice creams have they sold during that time. That same analytics in terms of knowing where the best places in Toronto to sell ice cream uh, to be more pro uh, proactive allows these vendors that sell ice cream to save gas and save operations uh, costs in terms of the ice cream trucks uh, driving all over the city to sell ice cream. As I mentioned, you know, this is a 15 minute introduction and there's a full on 45 minute session that's made available. Uh, these are the links that are available to you to actually go out and capture that information as well as the uh, GitHub repo that's available for the mousetrap solution for you to have your own spin on the solution itself. 
We also have the Microsoft Learn module collection specifically for IoT that's also available that pertains specifically to this presentation. And also the certification alert to, to you know, further your understanding and to you know, verify what you've learned. Uh, it can be certified and, and to uh, test out your ability to say, hey, you know what, I understand all the concepts that are available so that when you're helping your organization deploy their IoT solution, you are at, already at the top bar in terms of that implementation. And that's the end of my presentation. So now I guess uh, Jason's going to come back and we're going to take some questions. So much good stuff, Anthony. Thank you so much for, for sharing all that. Um, I, I just went over while you were talking and went over and grabbed one of my Raspberry Pis. I have a whole bunch <laughs> of them just collecting dust back there along with along with other things like uh, uh, this little, uh, I don't know, Adafruit thing. But um, what I wanted to say was, you know, so much of the things that you're talking about, I mean, we could talk about this forever. So uh, we got a few questions we're going to get to, um, but all of the slides, all that kind of stuff is, is available to uh, to everybody who's watching this stuff. So we're going to keep scooting along pretty good here. Uh, if there's something you miss, uh, you'll be able to get all that stuff um, again later on uh, uh, from the different links. We'll be sharing those throughout the show as well. Um, but one of the questions that we did have in chat from Alexa is, let me pull it up here and just make sure I get it right, is how do I know which technologies to include in an IoT solution built on Microsoft Azure? What are your thoughts on that? So the biggest piece of that is, as mentioned before, don't add technology for the sake of adding technology. Understand the business problem as a whole uh, or the opportunity as a whole. When you've gone through the analysis in terms of the information that you need to capture to sell that opportunity, then you look at the Azure IoT suite to see which parts will actually fit uh, into the scenario that you want to capture uh, that information or provide a deduction to or a response to. That's your best way of implementing the solution. Don't start with the technology st first. Start with the opportunity, understand it, and then see how this technology pieces fit into your solution. Excellent. Yeah, I think one of the one of the great kind of takeaways from the keynote that we heard was that a lot of this stuff we can start think of almost like Lego blocks, where we just kind of plug and play and add things as we need them. Uh, it sounds like the digital twins is is a perfect real life example of technology that enables that. Um, you know, now we're starting to really find ways to measure our environment. We need to be able to scale that, uh, all all that kind of stuff. So. Um, Excellent question. Thank you for that response and that uh, uh, helpful information, Anthony. I think um, we got a few things here, though, we want to move on to and at least share with everybody so that we can uh, get on to our next session. But we do have a few links that we want to share so that everybody knows where they can go get all of the stuff. Uh, anything that you might have missed today, you can uh, go find at the AKA ms dot, uh, so, sorry, aka.ms slash IOTLP slash blog. Uh, that's where you can get all the learning materials, uh, including the slide decks. And then the other thing that we want to remind people today, and I'll be mentioning it throughout the show, is that we're doing this 30-day challenge. Uh, and you can get to that at aka.ms slash 30 days to learn it IoT. Uh, this is a really great challenge. If you complete within uh, 30 days, they'll give you 50% off. Uh, so it's really worth your time uh, to go check that out. And I think with that, we are ready to bring in our next guest. Hello, Veronica. How are you doing? Hi, Jason. How are you? I am doing great. We're so far having uh, some great sessions, so much information to pack in into a very short uh, uh, amount of time here. So just to, just to um, sort of introduce everybody, to, this is Veronica Col uh, Kolsn Kolsnikova, a little bit of a tongue twister for me this morning. Um, she's uh, uh, a en software engineer in, in Boston, if I'm correct. Uh, with a master's degree in information uh, technology, has all kinds of hobbies, uh, loves to learn new things, including AI and, of course, IoT stuff. We're really excited to have Veronica on here. So, Veronica, I'm going to let you take it from here and uh, share what you have with the rest of us. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to my session, Deciphering Data. Uh, my name is Veronica Kalesnikova. I know I have a tricky last name, but that's okay. Um, I'm a senior software engineer and also I'm a Microsoft MVP in AI. And here you can see my Twitter handle in case you want to follow me or have some questions later. Um, in this session, there will be three main parts, a brief introduction to IoT, a discussion around IoT data architecture, and a look at common data patterns for processing IoT data. Also, I will be mentioning some tips and tricks 
around uh, data architecture for your IoT solutions that will help you to save some money and maximize your ROI. Now, innovation and commoditization have driven tremendous growth of IoT solutions across numerous industries. With the help of cloud technologies, um, we can create solutions that are globally available and have practically unlimited compute resources. Then we have IoT enabled devices that can uh, perform different, type, uh, different types of actions and definitely help a lot in all kinds of industries. And then we are able to use um, AI capabilities, whether we're using them in the cloud or locally on edge devices. And then uh, digital twins are mapping the complexity of the physical world using virtual models, and they are enabling us to address more complex problems. So I know I have a lot of information here, and I just want to remind you that I'm going to share the slides later. Uh, you'll have access to that presentation. Um, in the context of this session, I will be uh, mentioning some examples related to smart factories. Um, those factories are monitoring HVAC systems, machining tools, production line quality, and raw materials. But you will be able to implement the knowledge from this session to other IoT solutions, because most of principles we'll be discussing, they are universal. At a high level, the architecture of an IoT solution is made of three main components. So the first component here is things. Um, those are mostly IoT devices um, that are generating data. Um, for example, it's, uh, it might be a tool to monitor temperature or humidity in the room and then share the data. Um, next one here is insights. And insights are based on the data provided by things. And the third part is actions. Uh, those actions are based on insights. Um, there are several types of actions you might want to use. Um, for example, if we are receiving information about the temperature from uh, uh, things and insights, and, and we see that the temperature is too high, we can automate that process using machine learning. So uh, when our machine learning model notices the anomaly, it will automatically um, send an action to our system to lower down the temperature or it can be um, something more manual when you are integrating email um, to your maintenance team. So actual uh, people can go and lower down the temperature. We are going to start with uh, the things and step through several scenarios, starting with the simplest. In this scenario, we have um, IoT device or a group of IoT devices um, which are uh, capable of providing IP connection directly to a cloud gateway and share information back and forth. Um, we need to make sure that um, the connection is secure. So um, definitely make sure that it is connected properly. And those IoT devices uh, are providing two types of messages, telemetry messages and alert messages, where telemetry messages mostly contain um, just monitoring information, um, depends on ki what kind of IoT devices you are using. For example, it is uh, telling you the current, um, current situation, current information about your device. Um, um, on the other hand, the alert messages, they are notifying us that something is going wrong. Um, for example, um, 
as I mentioned before, uh, my favorite example about the temperature, when the temperature is too high, we're getting the alert. Um, then we need to actually serialize those um, messages uh, based on data types and network bandwidth. If we're getting mostly um, text information like the temperature or status of your device, then we might want to use um, JSON format serialization because JSON format is used not only in, um, in industry specific uh, data transfers, but also in other industries. And um, we don't need to deserialize it in most of cases. If we're using um, more um, image data or video, then we might want to um, use binary serialization, um, something like Avro or Pro Google Protobath uh, would be awesome, but you need to remember to deserialize it when um, it's um, in the cloud. Then those messages, they need to have uh, metadata attached to them. So we know um, which device sent uh, that message, when that happened, if it's an alert or a telemetry message, and also some uh, schema data, um, schema type that that type might change with time or uh, the type of serialization so we can deserialize it. Next, I want to talk about gateways. Uh, gateways are enabling IoT communications across domains. First a gateway that I want to mention here is a field gateway. Usually, uh, it's a good idea to use field gateways with constrained devices that are not capable to um, actually provide that direct IP connection, secure connection to our, IO, um, to our cloud gateway. Um, that's why they need that uh, middle man, so-called, in between, and um, field gateways can actually perform that action for them. Um, I know there are lots of older devices um, are still in use in different factories, um, so field gateway can actually solve a um, potential issue with industry-specific protocols. It can convert those um, specific protocols to more uh, widely used ones and um, connect to a cloud gateway. Um, and then it can also act um, on behalf of those devices and send the information uh, back and forth between the constrained devices and the cloud gateway. Next, I want to talk about the custom cloud gateways. Um, a custom cloud gateway integrates devices in different networks or clouds. Um, a great example can be uh, monitoring of uh, raw materials where we don't have that um, consistent connection, and that's why we can't just directly connect to the cloud gateway. Um, we might um, we might want uh, we might use um, custom protocols uh, between our IoT devices and the cl custom uh, cloud gateway, um, something like LoRaWAN, Sigfox, and uh, Particle. No, I'm moving too fast, <laughs> which is we have lots of information here. I want to cover everything. Um, next, I want to talk about intelligent age devices and why you will want to use them in your IoT solutions. Um, the first reason is where a low latency response is critical and the time value of data might be measured in milliseconds. And here I have uh, an example uh, where we have a leaf uh, which is spinning really fast um, and provides um, lots of data. And at the same time, we need to react fast if something goes wrong. Um, when a leaf 
sends an alert message. We don't have too much time to send the um, information to the cloud, process it, and then send it back to perform some action. That's why we might want to use intelligent edge device uh, process information um, and perform some kind of action to uh, fix the issue there and only after that send that um, data to the cloud. The analogy here is our nervous system. Uh, we all know if we touch something hot with a hand, we remove the hand immediately. And only after that, our nervous system is sending a message to the brain to notify that that happens. Um, next, um, I want to mention the um, time value of data. And um, again, LEAF can be a good example here. It is spinning very fast and producing lots and lots of data. Maybe not all of that data is important for us, and uh, we don't want to send all the data to the cloud gateway. Um, that's why we can use intelligent edge device to aggregate the data, group it, and then send it to the cloud gateway. It will definitely save us um, some money and will make the solution more efficient. It won't clog our network. Um, next, I want to talk about um, the local stream processing. Um, when you are using a um, um, sensor um, that is generating lots of telemetry information and um, sending to the cloud is um, too expensive, then we might want to use intelligent edge device and also um, have local intelligence right on the edge device like a machine learning model or create new machine learning models right on intelligent edge device so we don't need to um, uh, store that expensive machine learning model in the cloud gateway it will save us time and it will save us um, money if we have um, the machine learning model on our intelligent edge device Now we have the IoT data in the cloud, so I want to talk about insights. Um, we need to store our data, and um, I think it's a good idea to actually uh, partition it by, um, by different types, for example, device type or message type. That will help us to actually faster access that data from the database so we don't need to provide uh, we don't need to perform a complex search there and then our database is not getting clogged with all that random data that we have there um, another smart idea might be to have two types of storage uh, warm pass storage and a cold pass storage uh, where warm pass storage is usually a little more expensive, but it is always online, always available. And we might want to use it for um, real-time reporting or a real-time action that we might need. And then um, cold store uh, path, uh, cold pass storage is usually a little less expensive, but it is uh, less accessible. And we might want to use that cold pass storage for machine training machine learning models or um, monthly or weekly reports, which we don't need to, to have right away every day and every second. Next, we might want to use um, data, data transformation before moving data from the cloud gateway to the storage. And then sometimes we need to actually process not just one record at a time, but process um, the whole uh, data stream. For example, if we're using machine learning to analyze the data and find if anomaly happened, it's uh, beneficial to uh, process the whole stream to figure out um, if there was an anomaly and uh, when it happened. Um, and also, we might want to uh, provide some kind of rules evaluation over that stream 
data. Next here, I want to mention reporting tools and UI. I already kind of mentioned when I was talking about the warm path storage. Uh, we might want to have the dashboards with real-time data and some kind of um, UI tools that will help us uh, visualize of, um, of our solution and what's happening with our devices. Now, uh, when we gathered all the insights and information about things, I want to move to the third part, which is actions. Uh, we want to integrate the derived value of the insights into our business processes to be able to make better decisions or automate interaction with devices. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of this session, um, you might have um, business integration, which is completely automated, which is using uh, machine learning models. Um, and when you have that alert about um, temperature, which is too high, or maybe humidity is too high, um, then your system automatically um, reducing the temperature um, to um, make our environment um, sufficient and appropriate for our devices. Or it might be semi-automated um, process where when something is happening, uh, you get an alert, um, you are notifying your maintenance team, and then your maintenance team can actually go um, and fix um, the issue manually. Um, next, I want to mention machine learning models again. <laughs> I already mentioned them a couple of times, but uh, if you want to integrate machine learning models and that um, AI capability, um, you are usually um, using the data from the cold path storage to create a new um, to create new machine learning models or maybe retrain the models that you already have. So I want to mention the extended session that will be available along with this one. Extended session is around 45 minutes long, if I'm not mistaken. So you'll be able to see uh, both recordings, uh, the shorter version and the longer version session. In the extended session, you'll be able to uh, get information about data enrichment, data partitioning, and stream processing. Also, more details about storage options, um, data visualization, and exploration, because there are lots and lots of options available there. I know I went super fast through the session, so I'm glad you have that option to um, get deeper into that information and get more details there. And then, um, I have all the links available for you. You can have uh, all the uh, recordings. Um, you can have access to all the recordings, access to the slides, and also some code samples uh, on GitHub. So feel free to access that um, information using those links here. And if you want to access all resources for this event, then please access the last link on the slide. Next, I want to mention Microsoft Learn um, options there. They have several amazing courses. It doesn't matter if you are in UV, in IoT world, or you are a seasoned developer or solution architect, they have um, courses for any level and um, any type of um, interest. If you want to learn more about IoT, if you want to learn about specific parts, so please check out here. I also have a link so you can access available courses. Um, learning this material is a big step forward becoming Microsoft certified 
If you are interested in a certification and would like to learn about, about the test and um, get some more materials in order to prepare for it, please access this link um, on my screen. Um, if you are thinking about it, then I would recommend starting with AZ220 exam. Um, that is certificate to become an IoT uh, certified developer. And that is it. Thanks for attending my session. And I'll see you at next event. Excellent stuff, Veronica. All right. Thank you so much. That uh, was full of information. And like you said, you know, kind of trying to shove a lot into a short amount of time. So we've got other resources and links that you, people can follow to see the full talk, as well as the, the slides and anything that they might have uh, might have missed. Now, um, in the time that we have, there's a few questions I want to I ask you. One, you already answered one because uh, I was prepared to ask you how in the world some of these older legacy devices uh, that we see out in the wild, IoT devices, there's no way that they can talk on an, on a network or communicate back to some thing. How are how are we able to deal with that? And it se sounds like field gateways is the answer to that. Is there any more that you wanna you wanna add to that? Yeah. So field gateways they are uh, the thing to go and to use in uh, that that type of cases, um, especially for devices that maybe not secure or just can't connect directly to the cloud gateway. Excellent. Excellent. And then uh, we do have one question from chat that I'd like to get to um, before we move on. And something else I should mention about chat, we also are doing some polls over there. And we've got a poll going right now that says, uh, have you used any of the Azure IoT services below? We've got a couple of them listed there. We'd love your feedback on what, on what services you are using uh, of uh, Azure IoT. Uh, but back to the question, we've got one from Sylvia here who would like to know, how should I choose an appropriate format for transmitting IoT data to the cloud? What do, you get, what do you got for Sylvia? It's a good question. So it depends on what kind of data you have. If it's more uh, text data, if you have some just plain information there, then JSON serialization is the way to go because it's, um, um, it's pretty much a standard for all kinds of industries. So you don't need to serialize it and deserialize it in most of cases. But if you have um, something like an image or video, then it would be a little tricky to convert it to JSON. So I would recommend using um, binary um, serialization. Um, there are several options there, like Avro and uh, Google Protobuf. And I'm sure there are other options available, but those two are the one I actually know about. <laughs> no, that's great. I always love when JSON is the is the answer uh, to the to the question. But uh, great, uh, great question, and, and thank you for that response. Uh, for the sake of time, we're going to kind of move any more questions just at, uh, into chat. So if you've got more questions, for Veronica, drop those into chat. She's gonna be hanging out. Uh, we'll get those answered for you. Don't forget the polls that are going on over there. And uh, I think. We'll go ahead and move on to our next uh, our next session here. And in the meantime, we'll pull up our list of resources here so that we can share with you where you can go find more information uh, because we're trying to pack in so much here. We want to make sure that you know where to go uh, get all of this stuff. First of all, we've got our 30 day challenge. You should go check that out. Uh, the 30 days to learn it's IOT. Um, follow that link to learn more about that challenge. And then, uh, like I mentioned, all the slides and everything are available. All this material, all these materials, you can go grab at aka.ms slash IOT LP slash blog. Okay, with that, I think it's time to bring in our next guest. Hello, Diana, how are you? I'm great. Can you hear me so, okay? Yes, hear you loud Perfect. and clear. We're really okay. excited to have you here. Diana is our third speaker today who's gonna be talking to us on some IoT stuff. And for the sake of time, I'm just gonna hand it over to Diana to you and you can tell the audience who you are and what you're gonna be talking about. Great, that sounds great. Thank you so much. So my name is Diana Phillips. I'm a cloud solution architect in the Microsoft One Commercial Partner technical team. I focus on IoT and AI. And today I'm gonna to be sharing with you the session on adding intelligence by unlocking new insights with AI and machine learning. Hello. 
looks like it's not going to the next screen. Okay, now it's working. All right, so in this session, I'll start with a quick introduction and then I'll describe AI and machine learning and explain how you can implement them within your IoT scenarios. Looks like I'm having some issues advancing the slides. Let's see here. OK. All right, so we'll begin with a quick introduction. And for today's session, we'll consider a simple use case involving a raccoon. These cute little bandits may be troublemakers around the world. And in some locations, raccoons can be a big problem. They get into trash stealing the goodies and spreading the rest all over the street. For these locations, raccoons can be a real nuisance. One day, Carissa thought, enough is enough. She was fed up with them trashing her garbage and decided to build a raccoon defense system so that she could sleep again at night. She started drawing and came up with the following design. When a camera detects the raccoon on the trash, an alarm goes off, scaring the raccoon away. She went to the store and she bought a Raspberry Pi, a camera, a flashing light because she didn't want to wake up her neighbors, but she wanted to scare that raccoon. And she got an Azure subscription. For this solution, it's worth noting that the camera acts as the sensor, the Raspberry Pi is the device, and the flashing light handles the action. Azure manages the entire solution. So once she had the necessary components, she had to start thinking more about how to build her solution. So before we get into the solution, let's step back and talk a little bit about artificial intelligence. So to solve a problem with a camera, she needs to build something that can evaluate an image to detect whether or not it contains a raccoon. This type of problem can be hard to solve with traditional programming, but it's fairly easy with artificial intelligence. So it's important to understand what machine learning is. The most general definition is that it's giving your computer the ability to learn things without explicitly programming it. So when I'm programming, I would write an algorithm, run data through that algorithm, and then get an answer. But with machine learning, this is switched. So instead of creating the algorithm, I let the computer create the algorithm for me by providing it with data. And so those answers are input. In the machine learning world, the algorithm created is then called the model. What we can do now is run new data through this model to get predictions based on the input. In the case of imaging, the process involves inference. Inference is about utilizing the information available, such as attributes within the image, to make sense of what's going on in the world. Prediction is about explaining what's going to happen, while inference is about recognizing what happened, like objects that are detected in an image. So for our raccoon defense system, we would create a classification model. You can see this as a function. And it's going to look at incoming video frames and then give a prediction on whether or not it sees a raccoon in the image. To create this model, we need three things. A lot of images with raccoons, a training algorithm, and an environment where we can run this training algorithm. We will use these three things to create our model to later use within our raccoon defense system. But what happens if unicorns also become a problem? If that happens, Carissa will need to retrain her model so that it can now recognize unicorns as well. 
This is done by adding additional images of unicorns to her data set and then training the model again. Now that we understand what we need to create, let's take a look at the tools that are available within Azure to create the model. First, there are domain-specific pre-trained models, including Ag Azure Cognitive Services and bots. These models are created, run, and maintained within Microsoft and exposed to you through an API within Azure. The only thing you need to do is access the model in the Azure portal and create the one you like. There are around 40 different models available divided into several areas. Vision can help your application see the world. Speech can help your application talk and listen with text to speech and speech to text capabilities. Language can help your application understand what's being spoken. And decision capabilities can include things like personalizer, anomaly detector, and content moderator. And finally, knowledge mining with Azure Search can help add information and knowledge to the data within forms and other data within your system. But if you dive deeper and you want to create something more specific or custom, you can bring in your own tools and frameworks and use services like Azure Machine Learning to boost your productivity. We also have the Machine Learning VM that's available for you to use. And last but not least, there's a lot of powerful compute available that makes training your model fast and reliable. So to create our raccoon classification model, there are a few options available. We could use computer vision. It's pre-trained with a large data set and can classify most common objects. For each object, it generates a description of what it recognizes within the image, and it identifies where each object is located. Computer vision also has an OCR function for optical character recognition. It can read handwriting, translating it into text, and you can even detect celebrities within the image. Getting started with vision is very easy. But not all objects can be detected with the Computer Vision API. You may want to create something that only detects specific objects, like in Carissa's case. She wants to be able to detect just raccoons and unicorns. She doesn't care about anything else. So for this scenario, you can use the Custom Vision service. This is a service that helps you easily build your model that can perceive specific objects. The service comes with a user-friendly interface that walks you through developing and deploying custom vision models. Then you can either use the API to quickly predict images or export the model to a device to run real-time image understanding. If you want to control the complete life cycle of your model, you can use Azure Machine Learning. This service helps you accelerate the end-to-end -end machine learning lifecycle and empower developers and data scientists with a wide range of productive experiences for building, training, and deploying machine learning models faster. It accelerates your time to market and enables team collaboration with industry-leading ML Ops, which is DevOps for machine learning. The platform is secure and designed for responsible ML. Now we have our raccoon classification model. It is time to find out how we can implement this model for the raccoon defense system. There are many different ways to run a model. So let's zoom out and take a look at what we'll need to create. So first of all, the camera is generating data. Then the data is analyzed by running the frames through the model to recognize raccoons. And finally, the program would take an action by turning on a flashing light. There are multiple ways of doing this, so let's look at two of these scenarios. The first scenario would be generating the data on the IoT device, analyzing the data in the cloud, and then taking action back on the device. In our case, the Raccoon Defense System would send every frame to the cloud, run each frame through the model, send the prediction back to the device, and then the device would turn the light on or off. 
This enables us to quickly tune the model in the cloud, but it takes a long time before the light is turned on and sending all of the frames to the cloud requires a fast internet connection. Another approach would be running the model on the device itself. A common misconception is that you need a powerful computer to run a model, but for a simple model like this one, a smaller device can be used. For our example, we're using a Raspberry Pi because people are familiar with it. But you may want to consider using hardware with acceleration, such as a GPU or VPU in your solution, depending on your model's complexity and desired response time. On the other side, training of the model is very compute heavy, so it cannot be done on the Raspberry Pi, and it's highly recommended that you do that part in the cloud. In this scenario, the video frames are not leaving the device and are processed locally, meaning the device could function even without a connection to the internet and act without any delay on the outcome of the model. We could even add something that would only send the output of the model to the cloud so that we could create a raccoon defense system control center. Both of these approaches have their own pros and cons. So let's have a, a look at a few of them. The advantages of using IoT in the cloud include centralized remote monitoring and device management, consolidating data from multiple IoT devices, and the access to infinite, infinite compute and storage to train compute intensive AI models. The biggest advantage of running IoT on the edge is the low latency for real-time response. It's really good for safety and security use cases. And you can pre-process the data on the device itself, meaning that the video feed from your camera or any other data generating, generated on the device never has to leave your device. This is a good thing if you have heavy security and privacy requirements. The best scenario for our raccoon defense system that we are going to build test and manage will be on this edge device. So we're gonna be using Raspberry Pi to run everything locally. This will give us the flexibility and power of the cloud to train the model, low latency of running the model on the device to scare the raccoon away very quickly. And then since everything is processed locally on the device, it's not taking up any bandwidth and the device could even be placed at a location where there's no internet available. Now that we have defined our application strategy, we can start building and deploying it. IoT Edge is a fully managed service built on Azure IoT Hub. This service enables you to deploy your cloud workloads to run on Internet of Things Edge devices via standard containers. It works with Linux and Windows devices that support container engines. The runtime is free and open source under the MIT license. IoT Edge runs Docker compatible containers and in these containers, you can run your own business logic. Through the cloud interface, you can manage and deploy the workload to your device. So for our Raccoon defense system, we would need three modules. First, a camera module, which takes care of the connection to the camera and extracts the frames from the camera feed. We would need an AI module where we run our machine learning module or model that has been trained in the cloud. And last, a module that will handle the alarm. Every module is a separate Docker container whose image is stored in the Azure Container Registry that's hosted in the cloud. To deploy these modules to the Edge device, we need to create a deployment manifest. And in this file, we specify where the modules are located and how they should communicate with each other. Using Azure IoT Hub, we can deploy this manifest to our connected devices. And when the deployment is done, the modules run and communicate locally on the IoT Edge device. Let's zoom in a little bit deeper and take a look at what's running on the IoT Edge device. 
On the device itself, it's going to be running the IoT Edge runtime. And by default, this comes with two modules. First, we have the Edge agent that will take care of the modules and deployment. Second, we have the Edge hub, a local IoT hub that enables our modules to communicate with each other. And then we have the three modules that were installed through the IoT Edge deployment manifest. The camera module connects to the camera and sends the frames to the custom AI module. The custom AI module puts the model score on the local IoT Edge hub. The alarm module receives the model score from the Edge hub. And in the alarm module, if the model score reaches a certain threshold, then the light is turned on and a notification is put back on the IoT Edge Hub, which is sent back to the IoT Hub in Azure for monitoring purposes. So let's wrap things up. In this session, you got a peek at how to use Azure IoT Edge and Azure AI to create a Raccoon defense system. We covered what machine learning is and which tools are available within Azure. The difference between IoT in the cloud and IoT on the edge, and how to use IoT Edge to manage your solution. For links to the relevant documentation, resources, and demos used in this presentation, as well as a follow-up 45-minute presentation, you can check out aka.ms slash IoT30 slash resources. If you're interested in using this presentation, and or video recording for an event of your own, the materials can be found out on GitHub at aka.ms slash IoT30. And if you enjoyed this session and are interested in other topics covered in the IoT learning path, you can find them all at aka.ms slash IoTLP. We covered quite a few topics in this session. If you're interested in learning more, you can find curated content out for the related models or modules in Microsoft Learn. This will allow you to interactively learn how to build intelligent edge applications and how to manage them using IoT Edge. There are also many modules on how to build AI models using tools like Azure Custom Vision and Azure Machine Learning. Also, this presentation and the associated LEARN modules can help you prepare for official certification. If you're interested in obtaining accreditation that can help you stand out as a Microsoft certified Azure IoT developer, we recommend you checking out the AZ220 certification. You can find details on the topics covered and schedule your exam today at aka.ms slash IoT30 slash certification. And for more interactive learning content, you can check out Microsoft Learn at microsoft.com slash learn. So thank you so much for joining me today and attending this session. Excellent stuff, Diana. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was full of uh, so many so many good <laughs> things, just like all the other presentations today. Um, uh, we've got one question uh, from the audience in, inside chat that I want to throw up to you. But first of okay. all, I wanted I wanted to just comment that the raccoon. How much I you know we <laughs> talking about this before before the show. But the raccoon, I don't know if you know this, is actually uh, our little. Uh, I'm here on my shirt. Oh here. yeah. Uh, Bit is um, is the mascot for DevRel within cloud advocacy, and the reason is is because uh, you know raccoons are crafty, they're uh, persistent, creative, yes. uh, work well in groups. Uh, and if we're honest, sometimes we deal with other people's trash a little bit too much. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I just loved this example and and being able to find a reason that I can, again, I can use my little uh, Raspberry <laughs> Pi here uh, for a new a new project at home. Yes. Uh, we do have a question in chat, though, before we run out of time uh, from Elliot. And Elliot wants to know, what do I need to know to be able to train my own custom object detection model for use with Azure IoT Edge? What are your answers to that? So we pretty much went through the process. You'll need to have specific objects. So images of whatever the object is, you want to have a library of several images that you're going to be training that with. And then you'll go through and kind of follow the process that's laid out. If you're doing custom vision, we do have really good documentation. 
on how you'll use the images that you have, that you already know, have this object in them. You'll tag the specific object and run the training process. And then you can package that model up. And as we talked about, you'll be putting that in a Docker compatible container and loading that on, on your Edge device. So using that deployment manifest and kind of some of those other processes that we mentioned. So I think if you're new to this process and you're very interested in it, the best thing to do would be to do either a quick start through the documentation or go out to Microsoft Learn and run through one of those learning modules that will walk you through step by step. OK, excellent. And uh, maybe one more a question of mine just while I'm thinking of it, because you mentioned the edge. Uh, and, and this object detection stuff that we've been talking about with the AI, what's, mm -hmm. um, why, why would you want to use object detection at the edge instead of in the cloud? What, what's the scenario for that? So the best scenarios for that are just things related to latency. So let's say if you're watching for something like trespassing or some specific situation like fire, maybe you don't want to necessarily do that round trip over the internet to the cloud to do the processing and then come back. That can be a few seconds yeah. and maybe four seconds is too long. So if you do want that immediate response, you want to process that on the edge of and I do also want to make a side note on the presentation that I did related to the raccoon. If you do go out and look at the follow-up documentation, in some of the places, it does call it a trash panda defense system, and it's the same thing. So I think here in the U.S., we usually call them just pan I mean, just raccoons yeah. rather than trash pandas. Raccoons are lovable raccoons. Okay. Yes, they're so well, cute. Yes, they are. <laughs> Unless they're okay. in your garbage. <laughs> exactly. They have caused some mischief around my around my house <laughs> with uh, getting into stuff like that. Well, Diana, thank you so much for your time. And speaking of those resources, we're going to pull up that link now so that we can make sure we get all of that information onto uh, the folks that want to check out more. Uh, see the full presentation, download all the all the slide decks from not only Diana, but all of our speakers today. And also don't forget to check out the 30 days to learn challenge, uh, to learn it challenge rather, aka.ms slash 30 days to learn it IOT. Uh, that'll take you to our challenge where if you participate in that and you make it all the way through, we'll give you 50% off. Uh, and um, yeah, it should be Really, uh, really good challenge and a lot of fun. So with that, I think we are going to now move on to our next session, which I believe takes us on up into uh, number four. Is that right? And we've got our fourth speaker here. Uh, say hello to Sarah Maston. Sarah, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I am really enjoying my day. It's flying by. I can't believe that we're already to the fourth talk. Uh, I've been taking notes, um, you know, like like a random, uh, I don't know, like a random raccoon over here uh, <laughs> going crazy. And uh, because there's so many things I want to go look up and check out later on. So um, anyway, I don't want to hold you up too much. Um, I'll just let you take it from here. You can share with the audience who you are and what you're going to be talking about. Hi there. Um, I'm Sarah Maston. How are you? I am a senior IoT solution architect here at Microsoft. Uh, you may be able to see my, my cat, Dennis, is joining uh, the presentation today. And um, hopefully you can still hear me. I've had something happen with my headset, but here we go. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about how big data 2.0, and that sounds like the buzzword, big data. I know it does, but I'm gonna get into this a little bit because IoT is your new operational data source. And I find this topic really interesting because I come from a data warehousing background. Um, and I spent 20 years doing data warehousing, uh, building data solutions, and really watched the evolution of, of how, you know, it just became an enterprise database, you know, connecting local systems, and then up into the cloud that we are in now. And so I, I wanted to go over some concepts here. Um, so I'm going to go over big data. And, and data in general, for those of you who are new to the database side and maybe working with some data warehouse architects now that you know their field is new to you. And for the data warehouse architects out there, you know IoT and embedded engineers may be new to you, but at the end of the day, you're all working with data. So if you really think about it, you know, an IoT solution architect, you've got the data scientist, the data engineer or data solution architect, and the IoT engineer all working together. Um, 
this is an interesting combination that really learning each other's language is, is gonna help bring those solutions to light. So for those of you that you know are new to the data scene, I'm gonna tell you about the three Vs. The three Vs are volume, variety, and velocity. So why they call big data, big data in the beginning is that it was the rise of the apps. And what that meant was, is it went from on-prem connecting all these relational databases into one big place to do reporting. Well, all of a sudden there was the web and there were all these apps and people were clicking things. And this was such a huge problem that it actually led to the rise of the cloud and how to compute that much data and how to store it. And so the volume is how much is being stored to be analyzed. The variety is that you know you are getting different types of data. It's not just you know a row and a table now. It's unstructured, it's semi-structured. It could be files, it could be pictures. The velocity is that it's coming in really, really quickly. And when you think about people clicking on buttons on apps, the machines and the devices are able to bring in the data exponentially uh, faster and exponentially as much. So just to bring in an example of how this is, you know, a big data problem or what that is, if you're new to the IoT space, is to say, you know, think of this satellite array. You know, this this is this is a radio array that's down in Australia. It is creating. 50 terabytes of vol volume of data per day. It's then sending signal and image data. And not only signal and image data, it's bringing in data around the, 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 sat the, the radio telescope itself, right? So you're getting about 600 petabytes of data per year. This is a lot. Um, for anybody who's coming in from a data warehousing architect background, uh, the eyebrows might have gone up at that point. Um, but this is an example of the three Vs. So the volume, the variety, and the velocity. So how, how are we gonna deal with this? But first, before we start talking about what we're gonna do with it, let me just go into the nature of it a little bit. Um, JSON documents, about, I don't know, five or six years ago, I didn't have much experience with those myself. I was busy combining data sets that, you know, were pretty much tables and relational. So let's look at this. This stands for uh, JavaScript object notation. And this is really the data structure of the web. And JavaScript is in the name, but it's also the format that many, if not most of the messages you're going to be dealing with are going to come in. And this is known as telemetry data. You've got a timestamp, you've got some measures here, and you can tell by the timestamp that this is probably coming in fast and furious um, if you're used to a shorter timestamp. So this is gonna be a lot of data. Let's look at the metadata. So not only is my device gonna send me measurements that it's collecting, it's going to send me data around the device itself. Where is this device? Um, in this example, it's, it's sitting in a building. The building type is a school. Okay, great. Now I can add new data to it and say, what's the weather? Now we're getting into a topic that many data warehouse architects are gonna be familiar with. Ah, I'm combining data. This is now getting more interesting. It also sends pictures, let's say. Now, this is interesting because, you know, on a slide like this, you may be, oh, I don't know, I can't really think of an example, but think of a vending machine. Your vending machine traditionally knows how much it's sold and it knows if it's out of inventory and it might not be able to tell you that, but somebody who fills that vending machine is going to be the one to tell you that. However, if you put sensors on this machine, now suddenly you could get very exact information about what product is out and then you're very specific when you're restocking it or it could be taking temperature information of what's inside, what's the humidity. But if you add the weather data to it, what's it like outside? Could I save energy by using the fact that this vending machine is sitting in zero degree weather? And maybe I don't have to use as much energy and, and waste energy keeping it cold when it's already cold today. Now, there are four main challenges with IoT data that people talk about all the time. And the one that we're really dealing with today is in this 
in this module right now is the combining of data with other data sources, this number three here. Um, but we also need to understand that this data lacks consistency. What you know, you could have 10 different types of devices, they're all sending temperature data, they're all different types, different formats, and that's a problem to deal with. Um, contextualization where does this device sit in regards to other devices around it? Where is it sitting? That metadata is helping, and that's really a concept we've been talking about all day today around digital twins. You know, I can I can map this vending machine, which is next to my gas station, etc. So this was all a bunch of, uh, you know, me making the case to you that IoT data is a big data source. It fits this model of the three Vs that maybe you only thought about that when it came to other types of data, but this really is a new big data source that, that we're dealing with and want to use and leverage and bring into bigger stories. All right, so here we go. Are you still with me? Because I know I'm going through a lot of things. And if you talk to anybody who's been doing data warehousing, you're talking about ETL, you're talking about ELT, you're talking about what kind of data warehouse structure am I doing? There's a lot of stuff once you get into this world. If you talk to anyone in the IoT world, we're talking about connection, we're talking about all sorts of things. So where does it come from? It's coming from all those devices. And we've heard in the other sister modules to this one, that I invite you to, to watch if you haven't yet, is that this is called Azure IoT Hub on Azure as our cloud gateway to bring in all this device data. And I've put the link here so you can go and learn about that. So out of the box, IoT Hub is going to be able to connect to a few other places within Azure. And this is really interesting because you can route the data into storage in a data lake, or something called time series insights, which I'll get into in a minute if that doesn't mean anything to you yet. You can go in through an event hub or a service bus and start sending, getting events from that data and doing something in an application. You can process it. So the, the term real-time analytics may mean something to you. Um, it, it was a big challenge back in big data 1.0 and a big reason why we were trying to figure out how to use that data. But we've got it again, and now we have services that can connect to, to IoT Hub right out of the gate. So stream analytics is really fascinating because it can do some windowing type functions, right? It can aggregate, it can store it into tables, or it can sit there and watch and say, hey, you know, that temperature got too hot or too cold. Send an alert. Let's go do something. All right. There are four main buckets here when you're talking about data landscapes and types of data. Since I started my career, um, this has doubled. So it started with two of these topics when I started a while back. Now, it wouldn't surprise me if next year we end up with five or six, and this will grow as, as time goes on, I'm sure of it. So we've got our relational databases, and these are your standard rows and tables. Most people are very familiar with those these days. Um, the data warehouse, now you're getting into conversations. Do I want a star schema? Uh, do I want it relational? Do I want to do something that's columnar databases? There are all sorts of deep dives into all these topics, <laughs> so I'm just going to brush on them. Um, but if you're interested, there is a 45-minute version of this talk that you can double-click into many of the things we're talking about today, and I'll give you links to that at the end. And data lakes. So we've got NoSQL databases. I digressed. I apologize. Um, so when NoSQL came up, this was really an attempt to fix what was happening once the, the web 2.0, definitely, definitely 2.0 came up. How do you store data as quickly as possible and how do you get it around the world? And so this is really, that is the rise of JSON and there's all sorts of materials you can learn about how NoSQL databases came into to, um, to be. And I'm not just talking about document store, I'm talking also about graphs, if you're into graph databases, super interesting. And if you are a graph database person, please, please, please um, go look at Azure Digital Twins. You are going to really, really get into that. And, and you may know Hadoop. Um, and so Hadoop is the MapReduce uh, 
you know, the big jobs on big, big data sets that have come up. So those may be familiar. And here's a mapping of where the Azure services fall on those four buckets. Ooh, still there? Still, still hanging on? I know it's a lot. This slide is here so that you can just map, you know, where it's coming from, where it's going to, and we have added this to the materials uh, for your reference. All right, I mentioned time series insights, and this is incredible. If you've ever tried to do a time series database, you're you're probably twitching. You know, it's it's not easy, but here we have a service that you can just click into IoT Hub. Um, again, watch the longer uh, talk on this, and then go out to MS Learn, and you can really get double clicked into this and and learn about it. You can augment it. You can share views. You can do all sorts of things, and then it's connected to your data lake. There really isn't enough time to do that justice. I'll be honest. Um, here we have this, this is an ideological conversation. It's almost, we could spend the whole time talking data lake, data warehouse. These two don't live together uh, historically. There is a new service from Azure called Azure Synapse. I'm gonna show a, a screen print of it in a minute, but for those of you who come from the solutioning side of data with ETL management, you know, managing your SQL scripts, you're gonna be really excited about that. I was, the first time I saw it. Whew. All right. Questions? Put them in the in the in the comments, and then we'll try to get to some. If I don't get to your questions, uh, feel free to connect to me on LinkedIn um, if you'd like. So here's a dashboard. We all know what a dashboard looks like. We've got some some things. If you look at this with the eye of a business intelligence architect or data warehouse architect, you'll see, I see things that look like they're pretty canned from a table. Okay, I see some charts. I see some alerts here. So that could be something coming from devices. And then I see something that looks like that time series insights that you ran past. So yes, the answer is yes. Um, if you look at what's behind this layer of analytics, you are going to see that you know these measures are coming from a Postgres database, could be a dimensional uh, data warehouse, could be just an operational data store, an ODS as we, as we call it. Um, then you see this lower quadrant here, I've got stream analytics and it's aggregating my device data in a time window and you can set that all up uh, in stream analytics and then saving it to a table. And that's where that metric is being pulled. Uh, I've got time series insights integrated. I didn't mention when I went right past it that there is an API SDK layer that you can bring the power of time series insights into your existing applications and dashboards, including a, a Power BI uh, integration there. All right. So if you go to this link, you can go out and double click into this entire, the demo that I've been referencing here and you've been seeing screen prints. Um, this is Synapse. Those of you who come from the data solutioning part of uh, the house will see the pipe there on the left. You may see that canister. Uh, for those of you new to databases, that's it looks like a soup can. That is our uh, international symbol for a database, if that's new to you. But right away, this is a place where your, your uh, report writing, your data scientists, your ETL developers can all meet here on Synapse and manage your work. This one I'm throwing up just as an idea. Many of you may have come to the session to, to learn, hey, I wanna do something really cool and wow uh, my boss and come up with a new idea, uh, especially if maybe you're a data, data person saying, hey, how do I get into IoT and how do I bring this up? I would guess that many uh, executives, many people, of every level are kind of interested in how do I put my device metrics right up there with my traditional, like here's my sales and here's my web clicks and all of those metrics that, that are pretty standard. I, this is really exciting to me that you'd be able to just integrate, whether it's stream analytics, any of that IoT data right into your dashboarding. And so for that wow sort of POC, uh, I'm putting this up there to just give you some ideas. And now for something completely different. Um, this is Logic Apps. So when I was, you know, coding a lot of SQL, I didn't have a lot of Java experience or Python. 
you know, it wasn't really, it's a different kind of coding when you're doing stored procedures or SQL. Um, logic apps are a low code way to get into doing something pretty cool. And I, I'm just putting it up here to, to spark your interest and um, get you thinking about, you know, if you didn't think application design and development was for you, there are a lot of new uh, tools out there, Power Apps being one of them, Logic Apps being able to integrate. Like this may be really exciting to you, especially if you're trying to bring that, that alert information into something like a Teams group message, that's where you're gonna start to do that. All right, so I have a QR code. Um, here is the link to the 45 minute session by my colleague, Christopher, where you double click into all these concepts. Thank you, you know, so much for, for you know, keeping up with me. I, I just, I can't express how I know this is a lot of topics in such a short a period amount of time. Um, here's some more resource links for you. Uh, we've been, you know, we have, there's four other sister modules, as I call them, that are gonna bring you through that journey of how do I, you know, connect a device to the cloud? Now we're in the, we're, what do I do with this data? How do I make it do great stuff with data I already have? And then just IoT solutioning in general. It's all set up to be 15 minutes to get the concepts, 45 minutes for anything you wanna dig into and with the accompanying demos. Learn alert at Microsoft Learned. Uh, we have the actual MS Learn modules that are paired to this session on the IoT learning path. So those are listed out to you as well. And I wanna say that this is such a great example. I didn't actually know about this till a colleague told me, and I just said, whoa, what a lot of data, <laughs> crazy. Um, so this is where you can find uh, more information on that project. Thank you so much for your time, your attention. Uh, MS Learn has so much to do. I want to call out the certification exam as well. Um, you know, the AZ220 for IoT is is phenomenal. There's also a lot of other ones out there as well. If you're if you're coming from different disciplines and want to increase your certification footprint. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely right. Um, thank you, Sarah, for, for sharing all that stuff and, and kind of just wanted to comment on that last slide there with that uh, uh, that dish is putting out 600 petabytes per year. Is that right? Is that the number that you said? That's what I that's what I read. That's insane. Yeah, I can't uh, even. Um... I know. <laughs> right. And, it, and it, yeah, and I can just tell, you know, based on on some of the stuff that you were showing there, like data, data is your jam. I feel like you and I would have some really great conversations about time series and how to how to visualize those uh, that, that information. You know, we're just we're we're problem solvers through patterns. And um, one of the questions that I that I have to ask, though, if we're talking about 600 petabytes per year, obviously, that's kind of on the high end of the spectrum. What is the limit? Um, within Azure, if I want to put some data in there, are there any kind of limits that I need to be concerned with? I am not aware of limits. Um, I, I, I mean, I am assuming that at one, at some point you're going to have to get really, really smart about how you're doing that. Um, but in terms of, you know, do I know the, whatever the word is for the zettabyte to do, to do, to do, um, I'd have to get back to you on that because as yeah. far as I know, uh, it is an infinite amount of storage. <laughs> infinite, I studied a lot of math when I was in, in infinite is like the word all in math. Right. Like all is a very strong word. Um, but yes, yeah. um, as yeah, far I as I know, there is number. none. Yeah, but I would imagine it's pretty high like most of the other Azure services. Uh, it's plenty to go in and, and start, you know, kicking the tires and playing around with tools and just trying to understand how some of this stuff works. Uh, but I imagine there is a limit. Now, uh, there's another question that we had from chat that I want to get to as well. Uh, from Alexander in chat uh, asks, what is the place of Azure Data Explorer in your IoT data processing classification? Wow. Um, that is a very, uh, so the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> So I feel like I should do a blog post that yeah, that right. can fully hit that because I know we're running out of time and I'm and I, the answer is yes, and you know let let's get let's get some information on that and post it out because it's a lot. I'd rather do that in a picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. So 
the other question, I guess, when I'm still thinking, I'm still like trying to wrap my head around this data, you know, size thing and, and moving that much around and, you know, aside from any costs, what, what say, uh, let's say I've got a bunch of data, maybe not 600 petabyte per year that I'm generating, but I've got a bunch of it and I do want to do some kind of filtering or something before I maybe put that into Azure. Mm -hmm. um, what's, do we have an approach for that? Like what, what are my options there? Are you, do you mean um, in the sense that I want to let some events pass out and some are the ones I want to pay attention to from the IOT side? Yeah. Yeah, I okay. think so. And especially if I'd like to get those things into something, you know, like Azure mm -hmm. Storage or Power BI so, or. So yeah. Stream Analytics is probably going to be your, one of your best choices there. Okay. Yeah, and you mentioned a little bit about stream analytics, I think, in, in one of your slides. Uh, and our, the problem our, is, is like there could be hours. There exactly. is just so much on each of these things. All of these things are so cool that it is so hard to be like, there's stream analytics. And right. off we go. So yes, yeah, so stream analytics, you're able to identify any alerts. Um, I think technically you could also use Azure Functions right. um, to be doing some stuff like that. Uh, the, you know, the static within the noise. Stream Analytics, by the, there's also um, some ML in there that it's looking for anomaly detection. So you can actually leverage some of the features of Stream Analytics to say, you know, this is just going along, doing its thing. But when something happens, do something. So there's there's a lot to explore within there and dealing with the, the static versus the, you know, important events that you're looking for. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, we've got another question from one of our viewers in chat. Uh, this one is: You displayed some live data projections. Are there templates that allow you for easy implementation? Um, are you talking about the Power BI um, showing the the live metrics? Is what I'm thinking. Yeah, I would. Okay. I'm not real sure exactly. Um, okay. Or perhaps the data visualizations of of some of the time series stuff. So, so there's a, a straight up integration to bring those widgets into a dashboard. Um, there may be some templates that people have out on the marketplace or uh, have released. I'm not, I, mean, I can't think of one like offhand right now, go here. Um, but those are, you are able to go get Power BI templates and there are many, many tutorials depending on use case. So I'm pretty sure with some searching, uh, you're going to be able to find some pre-med templates. Okay, great. And uh, maybe one more question here. Um, and this is kind of I'm, you know, again trying to wrap my head around some of this this big data stuff. And it's it's something I've I've recently tried to you know put a little bit more effort towards. Last year I started picking up a lot more machine learning and artificial intelligence and just cracking you know large data sets and understanding just you know, the possibilities that are out there. And I came across services like Databricks, uh, mm -hmm. Azure Data, Data Lakes, which you you mentioned. Is this where I should be going if we're talking about supporting, um, dis you know, distributed data processing for like really massive data sets? Am, am I on the right course? Yep. Uh, Databricks, um, there's Synapse. I did mention Synapse today. Uh, that is bringing in Spark. Um, let's see. Uh, there and there is HD Insights is still is still around as well. So depending, I'm a big fan of Databricks, uh, especially the notebook uh, management, the collaborativeness of it. There is Databricks for Azure, um, but yes, so that yes, you're in the right you're in the right ballpark of Excellent. if you need to bring stuff into memory to do X, Y, and Z. Um, that's really a good place. Cool. All right. Well, I think that. Uh, answers all of the questions that we have. So thank you so much, Sarah. This has been super insightful and helpful and uh, uh, I love your presentation. So thank you so much for sharing all that. All right, thank you for having me. All right, now let's get back to our slide here. We're gonna share some of the resources again with everybody uh, before we get to our final session here. But just a quick reminder and also a clarification about the Join Our 30 Days to Learn It Challenge. If you go to this link, uh, that'll take you to a place where you can go and sign up for the challenge. You go through the challenge and I mentioned that we'll give you 50% off, but I wasn't exactly specific on what. It's Microsoft certification and it's not just IoT, it's all kinds of different certifications in there. So. Um, go check that out and, uh, and you know, 
explore all the different avenues. Uh, I'm actually going through another certification right now. There's all kinds of great stuff in there. And then of course, all of the slides that we've been uh, showing today, all the presentations and even more is available at the link aka.ms slash IOTLP slash blog. All right, we got one more session here. So let's go ahead and bring in our last guest. Hi, Paul, how are you? Hey, Jason, long time no see, how have you been? It has been a while, my friend. So good to see you. So good to be part of this project with you. Um, like I mentioned, you are our last guest of the day. Going to give us kind of a roundup of what happened. Um, there's been four amazing sessions that have kind of covered the whole gamut of IoT. And the one thing that I'm taking away from almost everybody is this feels like a really good time to get into IoT. Whether you got Raspberry Pis collecting dust in the corner like I do, or you're just now starting to like learn what IoT even stands for. Um, it seems like we've got a lot of cool stuff for you to go play with. So uh, I'm going to let you introduce yourself to the audience and uh, maybe kind of take us from there. Yeah, sure. So again, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here today presenting the introductory presentation for Get to Solutioning Strategy and Best Practices When Mapping Designs from Edge to Cloud. My name is Paul DiCarlo, and I'm a principal cloud advocate here at Microsoft and also lead for IoT advocacy within our developer relations group. So in today's session, we're going to cover three really big topics in the short amount of time we have. The first one being uh, strategies for securing IoT device connectivity in real world environments. We'll then look at how a common IoT solution architecture can be adapted to really outfit a variety of different business verticals. And finally, we'll look at putting it all together in an introduction to techniques for implementing artificial intelligence at the edge to support an intelligent video analytics IoT solution. So let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna go ahead and begin by addressing really the big elephant in the room when it comes to Internet of Things solutions, and that is of course the concept of security. How do we enforce security and solutions that typically require the use of sensors in the real world, sometimes in publicly accessible areas? And as you might expect, it all really begins down at the device, but we also have to look into areas like the communication layer and, of course, take into consideration the cloud hosting environment as well. So we're going to go ahead and look at an overview on how Microsoft provides security for IoT solutions in each of these areas. So security concerns as they relate to IoT is a very real thing. In fact, if you consider uh, recently the October 2016 Mirai botnet attack in which roughly 100,000 IoT devices were taken over by hackers and turned into a botnet. That botnet was then used to launch a distributed denial of service attack. The immediate impact of which was that it knocked off the East Coast of the United States from the internet for an entire day, meaning no Netflix, no chatting, no online shopping. Now, think that's crazy. Imagine hackers getting access to your corporate data by way of an internet connected fish tank. Sounds pretty unbelievable, but this actually happened recently to a big casino in Las Vegas where the attackers used a vulnerability in, yes, an aquarium thermometer to gain a foothold into the casino's network. And once they were in, they retrieved the casino's high roller database, which they then used to their advantage. But also industrial systems are also susceptible to this type of attack. Uh, in the recent Triton malware attack, hackers intended to manipulate layers of built-in emergency shutdown protocols that keep plant systems up and running and bore deeper and deeper into the system. And if you think about this, if a malware can defeat plant safety shutdown protocols, then it can work to sabotage that system in countless ways, perhaps disastrous. Now, thankfully in this attack, the malware accidentally triggered an emergency shutdown system that allowed it to be noticed and mitigated before it could do any real harm. Now, as we've seen here, security in IoT solutions is paramount. And IoT, of course, implies the presence of devices, often with access to mission critical controls, sensor data, and maybe even access to real-time video in computer vision-based AI at the edge scenarios. And securing these IoT solutions requires mitigation across all of the relevant data pathways, beginning with the device itself, its communication layer to both internal and external services, which typically involve a connection to the cloud environment, which also implies needing to have security within the cloud environment itself. So Microsoft IoT services take security into account really in all of these layers of the IoT solution, beginning with the device, that pathway to the cloud, and within the cloud itself. 
And whether you're employing an IoT Edge-based solution or a microcontroller-based approach with, say, something like the Azure Sphere, the Azure IoT security architecture that's built into all of our devices and SDKs allows you to monitor, again, beginning at that device level, and can provide you dashboards within Microsoft Azure for monitoring the security state across all of your device workloads within something we call Azure Defender for IoT. And this integration is really built in directly into the Azure IoT device SDKs, the IoT Edge runtime, and into the silicon itself in the case of the Azure Sphere hardware. So now you can kind of rest assured and have peace of mind that if you are building IoT solutions that are leveraging these Microsoft device SDKs and services or hardware, it means that security integration is available to your solution pretty much right from the start. And of course, within the Azure cloud itself, you can rely on security and disaster recovery options in each of the 60 plus and growing global data centers that make up the Azure cloud. And this availability is really great because it assures you that no matter where your devices are in the world, you can expect low latency connectivity and throughput with that ability to enable things like multi-region failover protection to ensure your IoT solutions are always up and running. And your security teams can also benefit from the protection that Microsoft Azure employs itself across its own data centers. And so this means that if your solution requires things like industry compliance standards, that's also another area where we're ready to welcome you with a current offering of 93, again, in counting available compliance offerings. Now, just like all the other sessions that you've seen as part of this all around Azure IoT series, they're all backed by a longer 45 minute presentation that really goes into the nuts and bolts or the deep divey aspects of what we're presenting in these introductory sessions. And in the follow-up presentation for this session, we're gonna go into detail on approaches that really show you how to adapt your Azure IoT solutions to accommodate what would traditionally be considered tricky environments in a secure manner. For example, if you have things like legacy devices that are not capable of running the secure device SDKs or the Azure IoT Edge runtime, which give you that security integration out of the box, that's okay. We can still ensure security across your communication layer by employing things like the Azure IoT Edge gateway. And this offering will allow for a variety of configurations that you'll see listed here that can aid in adapting to the types of environments that may exist within say things like manufacturing facilities, offshore or intermittent remote environments, and even air-gapped internal networks that may have absolutely no outbound internet access at all. And in that session, we're gonna go ahead and examine those configuration strategies and the environments they're best suited for in depth. And the goal there is to leave you, the viewer, confident that Azure IoT services can be leveraged in even the most challenging environments, provided that you have knowledge of the patterns that can enable secure connectivity for your workloads. Now that we've explained how Azure IoT solutions built on Microsoft SDKs and Azure Cloud Services can ensure security within even the most challenging network environments, we can now begin to have the conversation on how Azure IoT solutions might be relevant to your line of business and what those solutions would look like from an architectural perspective. So recent innovations have really allowed for the proliferation of IoT solutions across numerous industries. And it's no surprise that much of that innovation has been iterative, beginning with the availability of near limitless compute and storage that was brought on by the cloud revolution. And this has allowed for vast expansion in the ability to operate and process data transmitted by devices at scale. In fact, we're now beginning to see full circle effects of this as computing power is increasing the support and unlock new possibilities for small form factor edge devices to the point that it's now possible to run accelerated AI workloads on devices not much larger than a cell phone. For example, this NVIDIA Jetson device that I'm holding in my hand right now. And as these innovations in cloud increase, we again get to see things like additional benefits, for example, with the adoption of digital twins, which now allows you to replicate physical environments into virtual spaces, allowing for a one-to-one -one mapping of the physical world to your cloud-hosted solution. We like to refer to this paradigm as digital transformation and see this potential of Internet of Things and AI at the edge as really the harbinger of mainstream AI for the masses. This is no longer an inaccessible field that's riddled with complexity and cost. It's in fact now more accessible than ever before and arguably with a learning curve that invites anyone who possesses the desire to get started. We hope that we can inspire your line of business to seek the benefits of these 
artificial intelligence of things or AIoT solutions where they can make the most impact to your processes and customer experiences. Now, the cross-industry relevance of IoT solutions really pervades pretty much any industry that can benefit from increased value, reduced waste, or enhanced procedures via the introduction of real-time insights and automated systems that are capable of reacting to those insights. For example, in recent times, many businesses are facing the effects of return to work in the face of the global COVID-19 outbreak, and they have a need to ensure the safety of employees and customers. Automated systems for screening and reporting of visitor well-being are already demonstrating the ability to mitigate the effects of contagious infections using these IoT-based solutions. And within the medical community, this actually extends further. For example, the ability to monitor patients in real time has been critical during times of surge capacity in our hospitals across the world and in helping to identify and properly assess patients who may be under quarantine. This can even extend further to additional medical scenarios, for example, things like smart blood sugar monitors or telemedicine in general. Now, one of the, the use cases that I think all of us are familiar with, or at least have heard about, is the futuristic vision of self-driving vehicles, which is, at its heart, also an IoT solution. One that really clearly demonstrates just how fast insights can be enacted upon at the edge, to the point that these self-driving vehicles can recognize potentially catastrophic events and respond to them safely and in real time. This effect can also be extended to additional things like, say, smart factories, which can utilize these similar concepts to do things like reduce downtime uh, by automating, say, their quality control systems and allowing for things like increased production and reduction in def defects along the way. Another cool scenario for this is things like energy companies can leverage IoT data to adapt to things like demand spikes or energy surges that, where they can recognize them almost in the moment as they happen and then being able to turn over that data to provide additional value to customers downstream by being able to do things like automatically dialing down their HVACs or heating and cooling systems during these peak energy usage events. And finally, in retail areas, we're also seeing this ability of adopting IoT solutions to do things that can allow us to gauge customer behavior inside of brick and mortar stores with a fidelity that really mirrors that of online analytics ultimately allowing for enhanced customer experiences by reducing shelf vacancy, optimizing reorder frequency, and giving the potential to offer product suggestions to customers in the moment based on perhaps what they're looking at, where they are, things that they've noticed or bought before while they're inside that retail environment. Now, as you've seen, IoT solutions can address a variety of different use cases, but it's interesting to note that in all of the examples that I just gave, that pathway from device to the cloud to the line of business application is really kind of similar. There are, of course, variations of the specific technologies involved when encountering these types of solutions in the wild, but workflows that involve using things or devices to capture and produce insights, which then lead to action, is really common to all IoT solutions. And once you understand this fundamental concept, you can apply it to a host of business scenarios to create relevant IoT solutions that can leverage real-time insights and really affect your ROI or bottom line in your industry. Now, we can extend this concept even further by using a common architecture for IoT solutions that are built on Microsoft Azure by employing service offerings that are designed specifically to address this common workflow. Our things are really just IoT devices that communicate using those secure Azure IoT device SDKs, either directly to an IoT hub or by means of an IoT Edge gateway. And once that data arrives to the cloud, we can begin to process and operate on the insights contained within using services like Stream Analytics. And that can allow us to do things like filter relevant information while our telemetry data is in flight. This can allow you to extract time critical insights into things like warm storage systems that will allow you to use them immediately, or you could offload the, that data into cold storage systems for archival purposes. The key takeaway here is that once your data is in the cloud, scalable integration of that data into line of business applications that can then take action on the data produced by our devices becomes very simple to connect using the available services within the Azure cloud. So what do these services look like in practice? 
We've covered a lot of the theoretical concepts here and laid out how you can do things in a secure manner. But now what we want to do is show you how you can really truly develop these state of the art AI at the edge solutions using the latest concepts in computer vision. And to demonstrate this, we're going to explore a real world project that was developed using NVIDIA embedded hardware and Azure IoT services to produce a generic solution that can consume multiple video sources to produce insights at the edge and in the cloud using a custom object detection model. So specifically, we're going to develop a solution that targets the in, an NVIDIA Jetson embedded device. And this is currently a $60, uh, two gigabyte onboard memory with a GPU slapped on top that can allow you to do GPU accelerated AI inferencing on a very small form factor device. And in that follow-up session that we're gonna to link to at the end of this introductory session, we're gonna give you full instructions that will enable you to replicate this solution for yourself. And of course, point out any of the areas of customization that could allow you to adapt the solution to detect really any object or objects that you train it to and demonstrate just how easy it is to integrate the data produced by this device into a variety of Azure IoT services. Now, because the resulting solution is built on Microsoft Azure, it is naturally aligned to the Azure IoT reference architecture. And that means that our IoT device is going to be instrumented with something that can communicate with Azure IoT services. And in this case, that will be the Azure IoT Edge runtime, which is gonna allow us to directly communicate to an Azure IoT hub. And then on the device, we're gonna employ a custom object detection model that's been developed using our Azure Cognitive Services custom vision service which will supply object detection results to a stream analytics service that will both run on the device as an IoT Edge module and also a backing stream analytics service that will run in the cloud that will filter results. And those filtered results will flow from our stream analytics service into visualization services like Time Series Insights and Power BI, which you've probably seen in previous presentations. Both of these services will take advantage of the warm path to allow for near real-time display of that data. And it's gonna also have a concept to be able to support things like ML operations or ML ops by having a camera tagging module that will allow you to very easily capture frames from any videos that are connected to your device on site, which you can later use by mirroring them into cold storage as training samples to enhance your model over time. And of course, Based on all of the features and facets available within the Azure Cloud, we'll show you how you can enable creating new models and then deploying those down to your device while it's in production. So at the end of that follow-up presentation, you'll be ready to apply the Azure IoT reference architecture to create custom intelligent video analytics solutions that can really address a variety of use cases. For example, by modifying the objects being detected and ensuring that you're capturing any data that's relevant to your business solution, you can put Azure IoT solutions to work for really any IoT related industry. Microsoft's own Project 15 was born from this approach and produced a solution that assists in conservation and protection of the world's elephant population by using this same demo application. In fact, the main changes here is that we adopted the or adapted the object detection model to detect what you would probably assume is elephants. And of course, updating the business integration component to allow for visualization of where those elephants have been seen on an interactive map. You can learn more about Project 15 by visiting aka.ms slash Project 15. Now for links to the relevant documentation, resources, and demos used in this presentation and the follow-up presentation that I've alluded to, you can check out aka.ms slash IoT50 slash resources. And if you're interested in using this presentation or really any of the presentations that have come before or the video recording of this event for anything that you'd like to use, maybe an event of your own, those materials are open source and can be found on GitHub at aka.ms slash IoT50. And if you enjoyed this session and are interested in any of the other topics that are covered in the IoT event learning path, you can find them all at aka.ms slash IoTLP. Now we covered quite a few topics in this session and I would like to share that we've curated a collection of modules on the Microsoft Learn platform which pertain to the concepts and topics covered in this session. This can allow you to interactively learn how to build and securely connect IoT devices to the cloud via the use of an IoT Edge gateway, building intelligent edge applications using IoT Edge, how to create solutions with IoT Central, 
and covers details on how to implement stream analytics both in the cloud and on the edge. And finally, this presentation and the associated learn modules can help guide you on a path to official certification. If you're interested in obtaining an accreditation that can help you stand out as a Microsoft certified IoT developer, we recommend checking out the AZ220 certification. You can find details on the topics covered and schedule an exam today at aka.ms slash IoT50 slash certification. And I'm gonna leave you with just one more thing here. If you are interested in any free interactive learning content, Microsoft Learn is a great resource provided at microsoft.com slash learn that can allow you to begin your own custom learning path using resources on the latest topics and trends in technology, not just IoT, really anything out there. And with that said, I'd like to thank you for attending this session and uh, wish you luck on your IoT education journey. All right, Paul, thank you so much. That was uh, fascinating, if not terrifying, to learn about the security breaches. Um, but uh, so much good information in there. And before we get to some of the questions, I just want to I just want to point out we've been saying this throughout the entire show today. We've we've gotten a lot squeezed into just these few hours. So uh, please do go check out all the links that we'll be sharing with you here towards the end. Uh, so that you can go and take a look at not only the slides, if you happen to miss some of that, uh, but you can also see fuller length uh, documentation and videos of everything that we've talked about today, including some of the certification things, the stuff that, that Paul had just mentioned. Microsoft Learn is such a wonderful tool. Uh, most of us on our team go in there uh, very frequently throughout the week just to just to learn new stuff. You know, that's just that's that's where we're at in the world. And, and it's it, very helpful to have that kind of a platform available to us to go in there. And I've recently discovered, you know, through our conversations, Paul, how much good stuff there is in there with regardings to the IoT stuff. Have you have, what, what's one recently that you've been in uh, in the learn module that you really like? Yeah. So there's a whole there's actually a whole series of learning paths. Like there's an IoT edge engineer learning path that was built in partnership with the University of Oxford that's on there. Um, and I think what's really exciting to see there is that, um, you know, just, just sharing some of the internal knowledge I have about some of these resources. Um, this all started um, back in February with the, the creation of the AZ220 IoT developer uh, certification. And there was an exam, but there wasn't exactly materials with which to prep for at least at the onset. There, there was some out there, I'm not gonna say there was none, but not to the point that you see today. And so arguably, I would say that if you look at like right now, this point in time is probably one of the best uh, where you can find resources that can enable you to both learn upskill on IoT services, but not only that, being able to obtain those accredited certifications. And I think the cherry on top too that you've been calling out quite a few times in between the sessions today, is that we have this 30 day learn to earn challenge that will allow you to really schedule basically a 30 day window where you basically say, I'm going to take these learning modules or I'm going to complete these in this allotted time. And if you are able to successfully complete them within the 30 days, which by the way, many people could probably complete them in a week, uh, you will obtain a 50% off voucher uh, to sit for the AZ220 IoT developer certification. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a great deal. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're we're going. Uh, many of us are going through certifications. I'm doing the AZ204 right now, and and just like you mentioned, uh, there. You know, I think last time I looked at it last year around this time, there wasn't nearly as many learn modules in there that really helped me prepare for that exam. Now I'm cruising through it, uh, feeling really good. You know, I think passing the, the certification is going to be not easy, but uh, this learn, these learn materials are certainly helping me prepare for all that. So yeah, I can't, uh, can't plus one that enough. There's some really great stuff in learn. Uh, you should go check out. Let's in the time that we have though, let's get to a few questions that we had uh, from our audience. We've got one from, uh, looks like Patrick. Uh, Patrick wants to know, Paul, what's the, what's Microsoft's best practice for certificate authority integration in managing device certs? I'm also curious about device cert life given so, so many devices require using an up and effuse in the cert implementation. Do you recommend going with expected device or question mark? So there's a number of ways to look at this. Um, IoT Edge um, today supports X509 certificates for secure authentication to an Azure IoT Hub. And that will ensure that your device has you know, not been tampered with and is communicating appropriately. But going further than that, we also have a service called DPS or Device Provisioning Service that can allow you to do things like TPM uh, attestation down on the device, which 
gives you like down to really like if is the device booting what it's supposed to be uh, level of security. And not only that, gives you this ability to back any of your devices that are enrolled in that service in an extremely secure way that can allow you to really monitor those devices over the life cycle and giving you some, some additional features and functionalities for responding to any sort of uh, threat alerts that might occur along the way. So if you need to revoke certificates yeah. or you know, kick a device out of your uh, authenticated IoT hub service, you can totally do that. So would definitely say that yes, um, certificates authentication is built in today. And I would say if you wanna take that the extra level, go look into the device provisioning services. That's gonna give you the really strongest way to truly lock down your devices in a secure manner. Excellent. Yeah, good, good, good advice there too. Uh, one more, one more question here from the audience. Uh, we've got one from Ricardo. They'd like to know what alternatives are there to connect low power microcontrollers to Azure apart from Azure Sphere. So really, any device that is capable of running either the IoT device SDKs, which would probably be what you're looking at for a microcontroller approach, or if you're looking at a single board computer, the IoT Edge runtime, so something like a Raspberry Pi or the NVIDIA Jetson device that I was showing earlier. Uh, but to answer your question directly, if it can run the SDK, that is arguably enough for the device to be able to produce telemetry messages that can then be consumed in a connected or backed Azure IoT hub. Um, however, uh, I'm gonna go a little further and answer a more challenging aspect of your question, which is what if the device is a microcontroller and it just can't even connect to the internet? That would then come back to the Azure IoT Edge gateway concept that was sort of introduced in the, uh, the previous presentation, where you can actually take a device and provided you can read the telemetry in some way, shape or form, like reading it off the wire, uh, translating it into something that's, that's usable in a, in a fashion, you can then forward it from the gateway up to your Azure IoT hub in a secure manner. So again, whether the device can communicate to the internet, whether it has a full blown operating system or not, uh, your options are either employ a field gateway if it has no ability to connect. If it's a microcontroller, try to get one of the SDKs running on it, and that'll get you direct connection. And if it's a single board computer, look at employing the IoT Edge runtime. Okay, excellent. And it uh, looks like we got time for maybe just one more quick one, if you can answer this one for Richard. He's, saying, he's wanting to know, uh, it seems that the particular device you were talking about for the uh, IoT AZ220 exam, I think this NVIDIA device, uh, he wants to know, is the Raspberry Pi not sufficient for that? Uh, so actually the device, the, the exam is device agnostic. It doesn't care about what devices you're using. Although I would suggest for hands-on experience and for prepping for the exam that you do get a hold of a device. And yes, a Raspberry Pi will suffice there. I think the big difference that you'll see with Raspberry Pi versus something like the NVIDIA Jetson is the NVIDIA Jetson device is going to have an onboard GPU. So your uh, ability to run larger um, models for doing AI inference at the edge is certainly increased by that capability. But you can also do running of object detection models on CPU bound devices like Raspberry Pis as well. In fact, uh, my colleague Hank Bowman uh, has a number of articles written on that very subject. Uh, so if you, uh, or maybe if I get a moment and you're hanging out in the chat, I'll go ahead and drop a link to his work there uh, for more info. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, well, I think we're just about out of time. So um, thank you, Paul, so much for not only your session, but helping organize all of today's sessions. In fact, all of the sessions that have taken place around the world over the last 24 hours. I know you've uh, ha had a heavy hand in organizing a lot of that. The information is gold. It's great. Uh, looking forward to, to hearing how everybody applies this, especially towards the certifications and, and checking out that 30 day challenge. Paul, is there any other things you want to, uh, any other tips or tricks of wisdom that you'd like to leave with our audience before we say goodbye here? Um, the last thing I'll say, I just want to jump on there. Yes. I would like to thank all of our guest presenters from around the world, as well as our excellent support team that's helped us put this event on, including the hosts yourself, uh, Jason, for helping. Uh, and of course, uh, you, the, the 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 audience out there that's tuning into this. And of course, uh, to answer your direct question on what is the piece of advice, I think that's summed up in the last two links that you just brought up on that slide there. So uh, definitely check out our 30 Days to Learn It challenge to get that, uh, that discounted voucher. And of course, check out the AKMS IITLP blog link for links to all of our resources uh, that you've seen today. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much, Paul, and thank you for everybody for joining us. Uh, this has been All Around Azure and uh, another session for 
Developer's Guide to IoT. We hope you enjoyed this session and this event, and we will see you next time.